Hello. Hey. How's everyone doing? Woo, let's go. <laughs> All right, so welcome to How to Succeed as an Early Career Researcher, The Junior's Perspective. I'm Pat DiMondo. I go by data and pronouns, and I'm a user research moderator at Activision. And today, I'll be your moderator for this panel. And joining me today, I have three fellow awesome juniors with me. Um, let me go ahead and go to the photos. Uh, this is a picture of all four of us lined up. Uh, can I have Sienna start, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Sienna Robinson, and I'm a user research moderator for Activision, and I go by she, her pronouns. Oh, did you want to describe yourself? Oh, yeah. Um, and then for um, accessibility, we're going to do a quick, a quick description of ourselves. Um, so I am about 5'3". Uh, I'm a woman, African-American. Um, and I'm currently wearing a black blazer and a black turtleneck, and you can't see, but I'm wearing green pants to rep Slytherin. <laughs> Always nice to have another Slytherin on the panel. Um, but yeah, my name is Carlo Escobar. I am a user research assistant at WB Games. I go by uh, he, him, his pronouns, and to give a quick description of myself, I am a male Hispanic with black curly hair, and I am wearing a blue button-up and black pants on the bottom. All righty. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Yi Chen. I'm a former URA at WB Games, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Alabama working on uh, majoring in educational psychology slash neuroscience. Um, I'm an Asian with black ha uh, long hair, and I wear a blouse today with a uh, black dress. And I also forgot to describe myself. Uh, I'm an Asian American with short black hair, wearing a black face and an Activision t-shirt. And today, our panel, our goal is to really share our experiences of how we got here. Because oftentimes, when you're a junior, you don't know what the heck you're going to do to figure out how to get into games user research when you're first starting out. So like, how, what was our first step? Well, that first step is mentorship. And let me go ahead and go there. But along with mentorship, uh, we're also going to talk about our first industry job, reflections, and takeaways. But yeah, we're going to go with mentorship first because the best way to find out about something that we don't know much about is to talk to someone in the community. So my first question is, what mindset did you approach uh, seeking mentorship with? What approaches have you taken to find a mentor? I'm going to go ahead. Um, yeah, um, so I definitely approached mentorship with the idea of connection. Um, I really didn't want my mentor or anyone who wanted to mentor me to feel used, and I also wanted to be able to have a mentor that related to my story and that wanted to help me grow in that story. Um, so I really took the approach of wanting to get to know my mentor and have them get to know me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so a lot of my approaches were, one of my first mentors was, um, was um, recommended to me by one of my professors who knew me personally, um, and me and that mentor are friends to this day. And I have another mentor that I met through work when I um, interned at Activision, and I also still get to work and connect with her as well. So I'm actually going to start on the other question, which is what uh, approaches did you take to mentorship? So I actually took three. First and foremost, just cold calling, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, sending a quick message. Second, being through the formal Grux mentorship program, where I did a mentorship with a uh, with one of my mentors, who I still stay in contact to with this day, and is a great person to work with. And lastly, with my own coworkers, and just reaching out to them, setting up uh, time to chat, 15 minute calls, that sort of thing. And I really like what you said, Sienna, about um, you know approaching these mentorships with the intention of not having the mentor feel used. Um, so I did something very similar, where you know from the get go. I recognized, okay, I am not going into this to look for a job. I am not going to ask for a job. That's not what I'm here for. What I am here for is to learn about games user research as a whole and to get to know these individuals and their stories and how they got to where they are. And what that looked like primarily was just going on LinkedIn again and sending a quick paragraph about who I am, what I do, and um, just scheduling an information interview. Yeah, uh, I think in terms of mindset, I definitely have a very similar mindset as Carlo and Sienna. Um, and besides sending 
in terms of approach, besides sending code message on LinkedIn, I also use this website called ADP List. Um, it's just a website designed for mentorship and it's totally free. You can just search for like keywords to find people who you want to talk to who, or you want to learn things from. And everyone I met there was very friendly and generous about sharing their knowledge. Um, and yeah, I think that's all for me. So it sounds like you've all had many different ways of being in a mentorship, whether it's informal or formal. So out of those experiences, what are the signs of a good mentor in the Grux field? And how can one be a good mentee? Yeah, you can start with so I'll start with what are the signs of a good mentor in the Grux field? And I will preface this by saying that I think that's subjective to each and every one of us in here. I feel that what works for us in a mentorship just depends on our personal styles. But one thing that I have found in my mentors to be a great um, skill is knowing when to throw you into the fire, but also knowing when to reel you back in. So to give an example, um, I work with a mentor of mine here at WB who occasionally will throw tasks at me, such as a usability task list. And what... I need to catch my thoughts here. And what his method is, is generally to uh, you know, show me how to do it, give me a, some sort of template, and just throw me in and let me you know, figure out my own style. And that's great because it teaches me how to find, again, my own independent style. Because at the end of the day, all of us here will go on to become independent researchers. But at the same time, whenever I you know, mess up or you know, I maybe could be going in a different direction. He knows how to pull me back in and kind of guide me and, you know, walk, you know, have a discussion with me in terms of, in terms of, you know, how I can improve. And I think that is a great skill. And who wants to go next? Okay. Um, um, so yeah, I think um, in term, uh, instead of finding a, like, um, good mentor. Uh, I feel like very similar to Carlo, it's it's important to find the right one. Either you feel connected with them because you have similar background or um, they're good to answer a question. So I think knowing yourself, knowing your background and uh, just list your question out before approaching to any mentorship is very important. And I think that also applied to the standard of being a good mentee. Basically, just be prepared before the session, because uh, normally the session gonna be like 30 minutes or an hour. So you definitely need to be use it as efficient as you can. Um, so just be prepared and um, yeah. And uh, uh, just sad note, that's another thing I really like about ADP list. Basically, um, before every session, you need to put a topic on that, and you need to add in a short description just to let the mentor know what you want to talk with, uh, talk about. Um, and I think that helps for both mentor and men mentee just to be prepared for the set. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Carlo and you said about it being a very personal to you. Um, the right mentor is gonna look really different for everyone. I think for me personally, I have um, sometimes a hard time asking questions that I would perceive as silly or something that I would hold myself to knowing already. And so having a mentor that when I ask questions, they don't make me feel bad about asking those questions. And instead they are able to answer them and maybe even provide a way to reinforce an information for me without making me feel guilty or bad for not knowing the answer. Um, and so that kind of falls into patience for, for me. I wanted a mentor who was patient enough with me to ask questions and kind enough for me to ask questions to them. And I think the sign of a good mentee for me also was I always wanted to come prepared to my meetings with my mentors. Um, I wanted a topic on hand or something that I was interested in to talk about so that I was able to sort of lead the conversation and get the information out of them that I felt was relevant. Just wanted to follow up on that point of uh, how, well, how can one be a good mentee? And I really like what you said, Sianna, about kind of coming in and being prepared. And I'd take it a step further and say, you know, it's, you know, generally speaking, it's about being engaged, but kind of 
tying back into that example I gave about my mentor and that usability task list, um, when having these conversations and getting that feedback, you know, sometimes, yes, you know, it's good to just take it, you know, you know, they've been in the field for a much longer time than you have. So generally speaking, they will know what are best methods and best practices. However, at the same time, you know, don't feel discouraged to have a conversation about what approaches you've taken. Um, sometimes you'll find that, hey, maybe your mentor will find, hey, oh, maybe he's right, or um, I like your approach, so let's go ahead and take that. So TLDR is don't be afraid to you know put your voice out there as well. And I think that shows mentors that you're very engaged in conversations and that you're really eager and determined to learn. Okay, did you want to go over there? Go. All right, thank you. So it sounds like you've learned a lot from these mentors, right? So I want to ask, what has helped you most in a mentorship? And how has it applied to your career development so far? So the question was, what has helped you most in a mentorship and how has it applied to your career development? Um, I think tying back again to just my mentor and that usability process, um, generally speaking, I think letting me be a part of every step in the user research process has been a great way for me to not only get to learn more about, you know, what expectations I will have as an independent researcher, you know, once I reach mid-level or senior level, but just building confidence in me. So whether that be through letting me be a part of a debrief and just letting me be a fly on the wall or to even just letting me have a slice of the, you know, of a report and just letting me write something, you know, even if it doesn't make it to the end result. Um, things like that build confidence in juniors. And I think that is something that has helped me tremendously in building my confidence. Yeah, I definitely agree with that sentiment of being able to own part of um, a high-level project with having that sort of guidance on hand if you need it. Um, and I think on top of that, to expand, the feedback has been really helpful. Um, it really feels good to have a mentor sit down with you and go through something that you've done for them and give you really direct and clear feedback on how to update and um, guide your process. And it also feels good when, as a junior, you go through that feedback process and there comes a point where you don't need as much feedback. You then can see your growth physically improving as you're growing. And so having a mentor that is able to give you that visual um, progress is really nice. Uh, I definitely agree with what Carlo and Sienna said, but other than that, I think another thing I learned during my mentorship before I joined WB um, is just to be open-minded because I talked to a lot of people and I realized just every job is different, even though probably they all call, for example, user researcher, right? Um, also, for most of them, their working content could be different from, for example, month to month or like week to week. So I was trying to be very open-minded when I joined the job, and um, it was very helpful for me because um, it allowed me to try every opportunity I got. And just because I just started the journey, I definitely don't want to restrict myself to like to a small spot. So I think just by trying a lot of things and to um, it led me to know what I'm good at and what I like to do and just to know where I want to develop. So, yeah, just I, one thing I learned is being open-minded. And my next question is, it's revolving around once you start the mentorship, it's the end part of the mentorship. So once that initial conversation or mentorship has ended, how do you keep those conversations going and do they even need to be kept going? Okay. Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Um, so I think uh, one easy place to start would be being consistent with a calendar or a schedule. Um, and that's gonna look different for you for once every month, once every two weeks, once a week. Um, but I think um, to naturally keep those conversations going if you choose not to go that route. I think that's where connection starts to come back in um, because then let's say you and your mentor have talked about a project or something that you're really interested in and you go ahead and you take that, take those steps and take the advice they gave you the first time. Um, once you see the results of what you've talked about them with, it's really exciting to come back and update them 
with the information that you learned or the things that you've done and the progress you've made um, and just keeping that conversation going by keeping the loop of asking questions, getting feedback, going through your own process and coming back to them with more updates. So I really like the points you made, Tiana. However, in my case, this is actually something I am still trying to figure out. Um, I am still a junior. I do not know at all. However, uh, just to tell a quick story of something that I have found that you know did work and I might take further later on. Um, before I started in this field, I actually met someone who I generally just gave had an inter informational interview with, got to know him a bit, asked very general questions, but something about that conversation that always really itched me for like the, the last year was I couldn't really go into more detail because I was so inexperienced at the time, but we kept in touch, you know, occasionally with chat, and a couple of months ago, I decided to hit him back up and just ask him, hey, do you want to do another informational interview where I can kind of probe you a little deeper and just learn more about the, you know, field as a whole now that I'm a junior and that I understand my role a bit. So we had that conversation. It went really well, and I learned a lot more than I thought I would. So that's something that's been working for me. But again, it's something I'm still trying to figure out. But I really like the points Sianna made about keeping some, at least some form of a general schedule or just trying to follow up occasionally, whether that be through just you know LinkedIn messages or just reaching out an email and scheduling a 15-minute chat. Yeah, exactly. I think like um, that will be the best practice, just keep touch with them, um, keep uh, follow the calendar. But for me, I think uh, when I work in WB, I was working at full time, but also I need to do some graduate school stuff. Um, so it's kind of difficult for me to keep touch with everyone, like even though like in a monthly basis. Um, so I think for me, for those mentorship I approached to before I joined WB, um, a few of them turn to be a personal relationship. So we add to like um, like Instagram or anything else, so we can just chat randomly from time to time. But for others, I, I can, I, w the only thing I did is just try to keep them updated and uh, just want to be a support when they have anything new updated. Um, but I think like if I have more time, I definitely want to keep touch with them. So overall, what I'm hearing is for a mentorship, as a mentee, you have to be open-minded and you have to be willing to learn. As for finding a good mentor, it seems like that you have to make sure that it aligns with you, that you can basically talk. Um, having similar backgrounds helps a lot. And what helped most of the mentorship was like letting them let you try things out on your own. And I think that's really important because sometimes we're just like, we're just like a baby horse that's just like waddling around, you know? <laughs> so that's often how it feels like, right? But over time, we, we get used to it. We get a bit stronger. And that leads into our next topic, which is lessons from our first scheme to use a research job where we can stand strong and we got the job. So my first question is, after the first three months, how do your expectations of the job differ from reality? What's the biggest lesson you learned from the onboarding experience? Um, I think for me, one thing I learned is really important is just be patient and be mindful on the thing you're working on. Um, quality over quantity, that's something our associate keep telling us. And it's very important, especially during the onboarding process. Um, there are just so many things to learn and to try on. I was super excited every day, try to like finish everything as soon as possible, which is unhealthy and uh, <laughs> impossible and leaves more room for mistake. So um, just be more focused on the one thing at a time, basically. And um, to be honest, like even though I start to realize that, aware of that at the early stage, I have to keep telling myself just to calm down um, like for a really long time, especially when I feel like I start to be anxious about taking too long or something. Um, that's a sign like I start need to slow down. Um, but also on the side, side note, if you ever feel you already spent too long time on something, like longer than you expected. Definitely check with your senior, like other researchers, to make sure you are prioritized the right thing, but also to make sure like probably someone else could help. Um, so yeah, just cope, uh, keep open communication is also very important. 
So I like two points you made there about one patience and the other one about open communication because when before I first started in this field, I was under the impression that, oh, I'll probably be working on one or two projects, you know, go into the lab a few days a week, nothing too big, probably not a lot of projects. And for folks like Yi and some of you in the crowd who have gone to academia, you'll know that in that kind of domain, projects go at a much slower pace. So that was the assumption I was under. I was wrong. Uh, I quickly learned that you are going, or at least in our case, you will be working on many projects at a given time with very little turnaround. So you might be working on uh, you know, recruiting on one day, and then by the end of the week, you have to have this report out and you have to get ready for a debrief. So the pace of it caught me off guard, and it taught me two things. One, be patient. Um, again, quality over quantity. You know, do quality work, but also understand that you are young, you are a junior. These things take time to learn. And secondly, teamwork. Communicate with your team. Um, and I will get into this more uh, a little bit later, but your team is such a vital component to ensuring that your studies run smoothly um, in a short time frame, especially when you're working on so many different things. Um, for this question, I always like to think uh, back from my internship. So I was doing interaction design um, in a program for Interaction design, which pretty much focused only on apps and web-based products. Um, so I didn't really have a, like an idea that games and interaction design and UX were so closely intertwined until Activision was looking for interns, and I had that opportunity. And um, I'm apologizing for the Disney quote, but it was like a whole new world <laughs> opened up, <laughs> and like a whole new like realm of opportunities came. And so... It was hard to have any expectations because I was just, my expectation was I was gonna be in apps and web-based products and I got this opportunity to be able to work on games and do something that I didn't think was a possibility. Um, so starting from there and then coming back um, later on as a moderator, um, the first three months were definitely an interesting because I came in with an idea of what I knew from my internship um, and I think one thing I would tell myself that I wish I knew now was not to have put so much pressure to think that I have to know everything so fast just because I had had that short stint of an internship. It was only three months and I would definitely tell myself to not beat myself up for not remembering everything or having to ask questions and not knowing everything right off the bat. Okay. So overall, it often goes ex against our expectations just because we really don't know what we're getting into, even though we've heard a lot about it during our mentorship. And sometimes that's okay. It's okay that it's different. And that makes it a lot more fun in this industry as well. But also alongside that, I feel like you all alluded to this a bit, that your coworkers have supported you all, like let you know that, hey, maybe you can like slow down a bit or something like that. So my second question is, how do your colleagues, like your associates and seniors, support your career development? Um, I think for me there are many details. Um, first thing is, as Carlo mentioned earlier, um, I always feel appreciated just by them letting me uh, they just take me along the way, basically, either to show me what they were working on for the week or like show me how they plan the study, how they um, build and trust with team, for example, like, or how to do debrief, or especially like when they show me uh, how they build up a report, but will point it out like, oh, this is the part you have contributed to. Um, that make me feel like really happy to just be in the team. Um, another thing is I feel like uh, they really care me as a person, and um, the environment is just so supportive. Uh, for example, they are willing to just take time for me and solely for me to do any practice, or like if I just want to talk things through, um, they're always done. And this is true for all the assistants here, and 
I feel like you can, from that, you can see how much time and energy they're willing to put on assistance, um, even though they're extremely busy in this industry. Um, so that's another point. And the third point is, like, I really like how they gave us feedbacks. So, of course, they make sure to give us positive feedback when we did a good job. But also when we make mistakes, they point it out, but you know that they're not blaming you. They're just trying to help you grow. Um, that kind of like help make me know that mistake is just part of the process and it's okay and that helps me to um, just go further. But I think in general, just because as a junior, I really need to know what is wrong, what is right. I need to know how to work, but also I need to build up confidence and that can only be done in a supportive environment. So I have nothing to add to that. I think Yi and captures how they support us very well, and I would be repeating myself if I were to say anything else. So I will yield my time to Siana. <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I also think he um, captured it really well. I guess I'll add more um, like from an Activision perspective because I do think that our research team is very, very supportive. Um, as a junior, I always have people who are willing to give me feedback um, and I always have people that I can ask questions to and it does feel really nice to be able to, one, get the feedback, two, get the support and just to be able to know that like I'm not alone. And I think um, one thing that I do want to add to is there's like a certain level of like respect and... Um, like just thoughtfulness that you that um, I'm able to get from my coworkers even as a junior, which I don't know if I could say that it's like that everywhere, but at least for where we are as a junior, I do feel really supported, respected, and cared for. As someone from Activision, I, I agree with that too. <laughs> All right, so my third question for lessons from my first industry job, it's parallel, it's focused on mental health. Because you see, we've all probably grown up loving games, and, and then we end up in the games industry. And we're like, oh my god, we're in the games industry. And that can often lead to imposter syndrome, burnout, and many other things as we transition into this field. So my third question is, now that we're in the games industry, how do we take care of our mental health? And how do our coworkers help us? So like Pat said, uh, in this industry, you are working on some really cool things. I can't imagine there being one person in this room who does not like video games and either works in this industry or wants to work in this industry because of that. So, you know, there are times where, you know, I will admit I have been off for a day or, you know, I'm not supposed to be checking my Slack, but then someone shows something cool about some result and I'm like, ooh, I kind of want to go in there and, and see what's going on. But something that I've also started to try and hone in on is trying to balance um, my personal life with that feeling of working in the games industry. Because again, it's really cool, but at the same time, you know, your personal life is also really cool. You have to learn to sometimes take a break from, you know, the things you really love. And some of the ways that I've done that include, you know, whether it be deleting my Slack after a long day, going for a walk after staring at a computer for a long time, or, you know, when I'm feeling down or I just need, you know, a mental space for a quick minute, just telling my colleagues, hey, I'm not feeling very well, but if you need me, I'll be on or, you know, I'll be taking the day off. And they're very understanding. And I think, you know, what you said earlier about them wanting to support us is very true because especially when it comes to mental health, we're all understanding that at the end of the day, we have lives. We have other things outside of work that we need to get to, and if something pops up, it happens. So, you know, I'm very grateful to have a very supportive team when it comes to that. Um, but I would encourage every single one of you to please, you know, especially early on, learn to balance your life like with your work. It's a really cool hobby. It's a really cool thing to work on. But again, you know, your mental health is also important. Yeah, I think you definitely captured all of that very perfectly. I think to even sum it up, I would just say boundaries. Like I know that if you love games and you work on games, it can be really easy to spend your entire day working on a game, getting off work, and then continuing to play that game. Um, and if that's how you relax, I think that's a great thing. But if you are starting to feel burnt out or you're starting to feel like you 
are not able to uh, live life the same way that you used to, then you need to check in with yourself and start to create that like work-life balance. And getting away from our screens, which I know can be hard because all of our days revolve around screens in our pocket and screens on our desktop. So it's hard to get away from them, but just giving yourself that space is really important and having those boundaries with yourself. Uh, I think Carlo and Sienna almost like, capture everything. I think for me, uh, especially because I was in academia for several years, and I don't think I have a work-life balance there. It's just time-wise, time it's more flexible. But like all my work blended with uh, with my life. Um, so when I first started this job, I really like I I know it's important, but I really don't know how to do it. I know like I can cut off after p or five p.m. but it's really hard for sometimes to just curious about everything. So I think I uh, really appreciate all the researchers just telling me at my first day that I should prioritize my mental health and it's a learning process. It's definitely easy to say uh, than doing. Um, so yeah, just take your time and try to, uh, try to slow down and try to cut yourself out, um, off, out of the work time. So overall, what I'm hearing is that our expectations um, are shattered by reality. And, but the best part of being with our teams is that we are supported. And that's how we're able to grow. And that's probably one of the best things to rely on as we're trying to adjust. And also understanding ourselves and our mental health and figuring out what are our boundaries. And I feel like establishing that early on can help us grow even further later on in life. So our next section is reflections. And this is like reflecting on your journey so far as juniors. So my first question is, if you could go back and talk to your younger self, what advice would you give them when starting out in their games user research journey? Um, I think the first thing I would say would be like, you need to relax. <laughs> it's okay. No one is expecting you to know everything right away and you cannot gr rush your own growth um, because then it's not as authentic. Um, so just being able to be patient with myself um, and not try to force myself to, um, to feel like I need to know everything or learn everything right away and just taking it day by day and not being hard on myself because then that's gonna stunt my own growth. I think Siana captures that very well, but to add to that, I would say, I would tell myself, learn to work with your team sooner rather than later. Because early on, you know, when I first started, I was very used to doing independent projects uh, during my undergrad, especially when COVID kicked in and there wasn't as much interface with people. So it took me a while to realize, hey, I don't have to beat myself up so much. Like Siana said, be patient with yourself. There is a team of moderators there to work with us. And as soon as I learned to work with them, uh, studies ran more smoothly. And when studies run more smoothly, that means we get better data, we get better data, the developers are happy, and we can make changes and have meaningful conversations with them, which is ultimately what we're here to do. Yeah, I think it's exactly like what Carlos said. Um, I think I will give a more specific case, which is, um, because as Carlos said, we should work as a team, but for me, I think I would want myself to ask more questions. Um, so I think, because as Carlos said, like back in school, you are more likely to work independently, and there are probably no one to answer your question. Um, so for me, I just got used to figuring things out by myself, um, but also like I'm too afraid of bothering, bothering people, and I feel like uh, when people are busy, it's hard for me to just ask questions. Um, but one thing really helped me to relieve and open to ask more questions is people telling me like they would rather me to bother them or like asking questions um, rather than I take too long to struggling by myself or like make mistakes because of misunderstanding. So by knowing that, it definitely helped me a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, all in all, if I come back to the like, beginning, I will hope myself to ask more questions and ask questions at the early stage. So this is related to our first question 
um, this is just focusing more than just ourselves, but supporting each other. How can juniors in the games industry support each other at this time? Start again. Um, yeah, I think being open and communicating with each other is really important because um, we're all in this role like together. And so being able to like have conversations about maybe things that we can talk about in our day to day or seeing what someone else is doing and being able to ask those questions. And I think one big takeaway that I would like to share from this is to not make it a competition. Your growth is your competition with yourself and not with someone else. And so if someone is growing at a rate that you think is faster than you, that is a that's an opportunity for you to ask them questions and to communicate and not to be bitter or beat yourself up because someone else is doing something that you would like to be doing. So I agree with everything Siana said, but to give a more specific example, um, again, learn to work together, you know, learn to moderate sessions together. And the reason I have been trying to hone in on that point is because a lot of the time your leads, you know, your directors, managers are going to be really busy with a lot of things. So they may not always be available to, you know, answer your questions or immediately fix something that catches fire. So one time, a former colleague of mine and I uh, were trying to uh, resolve a problem in Microsoft Excel because as usual, Excel was having a meltdown. So we spent a good half hour just putting our brains together and trying to figure out which parameters were working, what wasn't, you know, why, what we could do to fix it. And eventually we got it fixed. And while that's such a small and niche example, it builds it built trust amongst each other and it proved that hey we can work together and we can do it well so um juniors learn to work as a team learn to work as a unit you're all there to support each other at the end of the day it is not a competition as siana said the only competition you have is yourself yeah i think definitely like learn to work as a team uh, knowing that is very important uh, one thing i want to add on is just uh, also knowing that you can learn from each other, just take a mental note on that, basically. I feel like knowing that makes me uh, more humble, just in general. But also sometimes, for example, I probably don't know some strengths of me, but uh, just by t people telling me, hey, I learned this from you, uh, that helps me to know like, oh, I'm, oh that's a strength of me. Um, so I just like, I feel like in general, just knowing you can learn from each other, um, can definitely help to build more values on each other. So overall, it sounds like we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to really get to know ourselves to figure out our boundaries, um, figure out like what are our strengths and weaknesses, and being able to be honest with your teammates about it. Because in order to grow, you have to know yourself, actually. Because every single person here, they have their own journey to go through. And like Siana said, it's really a competition against your, pre your past self. Um, so our last question for today, uh, for the slides, is what is a key takeaway that you want to give to the audience? And then I'll, I'll also have their quotes up as well, and they'll explain further. Um, yeah, I think a key takeaway that I would have is you might not be a junior forever, but you are only going to be a junior once. Um, so use the time that you have where people aren't really expecting you to be a leader, to be able to learn um, in an environment that's safe um, and allow yourself the opportunity to make the mistakes that you need to make in order to grow to the point that you need to grow um, because it's not going to be like this forever. So take advantage of that time now. So I would say, again, and I'm sure everyone is tired of hearing me say this, uh, learn to work as a team. So junior specifically, you know, the, the sooner you do that, the more successful studies you'll run and, you know, everyone will be much happier as a result. And for both juniors and I would say seniors and managers is to involve juniors in the process more or, you know, become more involved, be engaged. So, you know, whether that be, you know, uh, asking questions about recruitment or, you know, taking a slice of a report, um, being a part of that process is what will ultimately build independent researchers, which is 
ultimately the goal for all three of us, all four of us here, right, is to eventually be able to lead our own studies and mentor juniors um, in a much more senior role. Yeah, um, I think my takeaway would be just take a learning and growth method, uh, knowing that it's okay to make mistake and don't be afraid to ask questions in general. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, I honestly learned a lot just being part of this with you all, so I'm just thankful that we got to share your experiences because, again, being a junior is hard, especially when you're trying to break in, so thank you. Um, last thing, we have a Q&A for a few minutes, so if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Ooh, okay, I'm gonna start with the front. Okay. Uh, the question is, what are the best tools and resources that help um, you better understand yourself, um, especially at, for your growth? Is that it? Yeah, to find like, the right mentor for yourself. To find the right mentor for yourself. Wow, that is a great question. <laughs> so I have a very unique approach to these sorts of things. So I don't use like any formal tools like a Google Calendar or anything of that sort to keep myself in check. Instead, what I honestly like to do is sit down with myself and just take out a notepad or a Google sheet and just write down my thoughts on, you know, where I think I'm going right in things, you know, where I might be going wrong and kind of use that to see, okay, where are, you know, where am I seeing trends and how can I start to work on those? And once I have some sort of plan in place, then I will take that either, you know, I'll take it to my mentor at work and let him know, hey, here's what I want to work on. And, you know, we'll work on something together. Or if I see, okay, maybe I should, you know, be reaching out to people more, then I'll go ahead and, you know, try on LinkedIn or try something new. Um, but that is a great question, and I am going to be thinking about that all night. <laughs> Uh, I think for me it's very simple, just a pen and paper, just to write everything down. Uh, I mean, like in terms of how to know yourself, uh, how to know your questions. Uh, for me, I feel like when I when I was about to graduate, I, when I started to find a job, I definitely have like every thought in my brain, like there's just a mass in my brain. So I think write things down, like write journals, it's very helpful for me. And um, I think write and reading in general, as, and also like there are a lot of resources just in YouTube. For me, I prefer to watch videos compared to watch books. So yeah, I think uh, the most important is just writing down. Uh, yeah, as far as finding mentors, I don't know if I could say that I use any real formal tools. I know a lot of jobs and schools um, have like their own systems for pairing you with mentors. Um, so that's something to look into for you know everyone personally. Um, I think for me, my last couple of mentorships, I got pretty lucky. Um, and specifically for my first one, it was someone that my professor had introduced me to. Um, and I think that was really nice because it was someone who knew me and someone who knew this other person. And they kind of like looked at us and they were like, "You guys like something about this." And you know they ended up being right. Um, and that helped prepare me, pr propel me into like another stage of my career, being able to meet that person. So I think tapping into your network maybe, and maybe seeing if either there's someone that you haven't thought of that wants to mentor, or if not them, if they know someone who also wants to mentor or has that spirit or energy to want to be able to um, guide you. I also want to uh, reiterate, uh, you also mentioned ADP list to find mentors as well. So that is a good website. And keep in mind that you don't have to look for mentorship specifically in games or user research to learn applicable skills. So going beyond that is super helpful. There's a lot of resources. Real quick to add, my first mentor was not in gaming either. Uh, she worked in general tech, but she actually transitioned to gaming after we met. Um, so you know, you can also inspire your mentors as well. Yeah. And that's a sign of a good mentorship when you can inspire each other. Um, I remember there was another question here. Yeah, my question is, how do you get past the, the boring stuff? Like for every like report session, you get to write like some like five boring gaming. So the question that we've heard is, how do you get through the boring stuff, like specific parts of it that are, tend to be tedious? 
I think I'm laughing because I feel like for us, it's not boring. <laughs> I think for us, it's like, oh my God, we get to do something? Like, that's awesome. <laughs> So I guess as an advice for you, if you're a manager, give your boring stuff to your juniors because they probably like it. <laughs> I, I would say the same thing. I, I can't think of something where I'm like, oh my God, like I, I can't, I dread doing this besides maybe recruitment because I just done it so many times at this point. But even then, you know, the boring stuff teaches you so much. It teaches you, you know, processes, you know, what works, what doesn't, you know, and how, you know, Eventually, once you get really good at it and you start iterating, you can add your own spin to it. So, I, I, yeah, that's basically what keeps me going, at least. Uh, see, I definitely say uh, what I was going to say. Um, so I'm just excited about everything because like everything is new to me. Uh, another point, I think, because for example, there are sometimes you need to manually enter data or like you need to manually clean data. That probably is the part that you feel poor about. I'm not sure, like just set an example. Um, I think if I got those jobs, I actually feel like, oh, it's time probably for me to take a re rest just because it's kind of mindless. You just be patient, be slow, and that you will be this, you will do this job will get done. Um, not like if you have to build that report, you, need, you really need to focus, you really need to put all your attention on it. So I just feel like I try to convince myself for for those job for boring type of job, it's more like a rest kind of thing. Um, so yeah, just enjoy every part. I say. I also feel like when you feel something is boring, that that's a sign for burnout, and that's when you need to reflect on yourself um, and make sure that that you are okay, because that's not a good sign at all, and that's a good time to take some reflection, and maybe even touch grass. <laughs> All right. What was that? Oh, oh you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. Okay. Yeah, so if I get it wrong, go ahead and correct to me. But the question was what I meant by trying to find my own style um, when doing things like a usability task. Okay, so I think here, and again, I, I am trying to process my thoughts right now. Okay, so for example, like that usability task list that I mentioned. So, you know, at first you learn how to, you know, formally make one or just, you know, what that process looks like, what you should be looking for, the things you should be think about, thinking about. So general processes that you're taught early on, whether you're a moderator or an associate. But, and what my manager has tried to hone in, you know, to me a couple of times now is eventually I'm gonna get to a point where I'm going to learn to have to break those methods and find my own style in order to you know run successful studies because you're not going to you know get every single parameter you want um, in a session things go wrong you know all the time you know there's always a fire to put out so you have to learn to adapt be loose on your feet and you know find that independent style so for me what I try to do with these sorts of things is I follow the methodology but once I'm comfortable and I know hey I've got the hang of this then I will start trying to just generally you know do things how I would and that's very difficult to explain without actually showing it unfortunately so yeah I think I'll leave my answer there is there another question Okay. Were there moments when your mentor was not able to support you in a way that you would have liked? And if so, what were your methods to deal with that? Okay. So the question is, was there a moment where a mentor has not properly supported you? And in those moments, what did you do? I would say I've definitely had um, like initial mentor conversations with people that didn't result into a full mentorship because maybe I didn't feel like I was going to get what I needed from it or something happened where I just didn't want to continue to like develop those conversations further. Um, and I also think aligned in line with this question, um, 
knowing when mentorship is over is a really personal process. Knowing when you've outgrown a mentor is a really personal process. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that when you start to feel that way is to communicate it because your mentors are there to support your growth. And if they, if they hear you saying that you think you're outgrowing them or you think that this mentorship is no longer for you, they're, it's very unlikely that they're going to be angry or have something negative to say because they're there to support you. Um, and so they could also even give you resources to find someone who might even connect with you more. Is that all from Z? Okay. I remember seeing a hand. Okay. Yes? So, so as a fresh graduate myself, mm -hmm. how do you stay motivated in avoiding both burnout during the process of job searching and then like working on yourself and regular work? Okay. Uh, the question is, how do you avoid burnout um, as you're uh, applying to jobs and preparing your resume? I think that's a really good question. I've definitely been through burnout. I think because I spent probably a year just trying to find a job. Uh, I like apply, I probably like send my resume or like save it to 500 places. I don't know, like just a lot. Um, I think one thing would be helpful is to, because in that period, it means like it's probably in your downhill in your life kind of wise. Um, so you can, just write, it, write things down when you feel that something gives you more energy. Um, it could be very, very simple, just keep mindful um, of your life. Just you, or, uh, or another thing, another way to put it is like, you can settle a certain time like you want to put on this thing. So like probably for every week, I just want to spend like 20 hours on it. And other than that, just go to life, just you also need to t take a break. And knowing that break is definitely help you to um, go further. It's not definitely not an obstacle. So I'll admit it has been a while since I've been applying to too many places at once. However, one thing that I try to understand from the get-go is that, hey, if I get rejected, that's not totally, uh, it's not totally personal most of the time, and it's not a reflection of me or my skills. At the end of the day, it is just a job, you know, and I totally understand that all of us need jobs to, you know, live in, you know, our society. But, at, you know, it's good to take, breaks like you said and just you know sometimes turn off the laptop you know pat yourself on the back and say hey you know if you tried you know it's a very competitive process um, but don't give up you know keep going at it and you know if it really you know if it really means a lot to you um, just you know be patient be patient patience patience is, is key yeah, like you're definitely not alone out there I know when like going back to what I was trying to um, before I was at Activision trying to like find my place and like find out where I was going to be full time, I just remember thinking like, when is this going to be over? Like, when am I finally going to like make it? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's a tough process, and I would just say like, definitely like be gentle with yourself and also surround yourself with people who like support you in your process, because then those are also people who are going to give you the pep talks you need, or maybe even connect you with resources that you could use. Um, and just like know that like it's it's not just you it's just you know it's tough out there but if, with time like ev eventually you will be able to make that step if you keep you know putting in the work putting in the effort and keep growing. I also do want to add that you are worthy even if you don't have the job, no matter what, because that job does not define you as a person. So always keep that in the back of your head that you are more than just your job. All right. Ooh, okay, so the question is uh, going a bit back. What do you think was the factor that made you stand out uh, amongst other candidates? You'd have to ask my boss that, if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, he might be watching, so, you know, yeah, he can answer that. But there, there is a lot of things that go into the process. For example, um, the way it was described to me once by a manager in the industry was sometime, it's, it's like, I don't know, 
like it's like a spectrum. Like sometimes you'll be looking for one thing, like maybe you want someone who, who is an, a junior but has a specialization in coding, like using R or Python. Sometimes you might want someone who has a, gen, a more general skill set or someone who leans a little more to the qualitative side, maybe has a master's degree. So what I'm trying to get at is, you know, it really depends. Um, I don't know if there's, you know, one, you know, a one thing that will set you apart. Um, but what did help me was ultimately just having conversations and being transparent and honest. So just reaching out to people and, you know, just generally trying to understand the field. Um, I think that is definitely one thing that may, may have not set me apart, but did just help me when going into interviews and, you know, being prepared. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, I think I can just tell you a little bit about my case. Uh, I met my, uh, my I met my manager at WB in ADP List. Uh, I was super lucky for sure, and he was my mentor there for three months before I joined. Before I got the interview, I think. So one thing for me is back to the question you asked before. Um, so you definitely got a lot of burnout. But the thing is, you can only do what you can do. Um, you can only do the right thing. So like. When you be prepared when the door open, you're in. But if you're not prepared when the door opens, it's like just not you. So again, like, you can only do what you can do. Yeah. I'll just add one quick thing to that. So I really like what you said about being prepared and just coming into those interviews, you know, as best as possible. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, there is some sort of a luck factor. So a right place, right time kind of thing. But in this case, what you know, many people will do is they'll say, you know, it's out of, you know, it's totally out of my control. You know, I have no say over this luck thing, so you know, I should just, you know, keep applying and that's it. However, I challenge that, and I would say, you know, keep going. You know, do portfolio projects. You know, talk to people in the industry, get to know them, um, so that when luck does roll around, you are in that place at the right time, and you boost your odds by putting yourself in a favorable position. I really have to agree with what you said about it being luck sometimes, because um, I ask myself a lot, I'm like, how did I end up here? <laughs> um, it feels really lucky. I mean, I, I personally know the work that I put in, and I think when I saw that internship, I was like, I want that. And I remember how much, like, the late hours, like, working on my portfolio, and, like, how many times I got my resume revised, even when I was like, it looks good to me, like, can we move it on? But, like, you know, like, I put in, I know I put in that work, and it's really hard to say that there was anything special that I did, because I can't say that someone else didn't put in the same amount of work and the same amount of effort and didn't end up with the same opportun opportunity. So there is a luck factor, I'm sure. I just want to add that, yes, it's also the luck factor, but also thinking about the future, because as juniors, we are the future of the games industry. So we have to think about what kind of future do we want for the games industry? Because that's what we're going to contribute overall. And I feel like by keeping that in mind, it helped me kept going because it led me to feel like I'm going to make a difference. And that's really important. And I really want to make sure that, for example, people like me that are um, LGBT, that are Asian American, that um, are feminine appearing, I want a future for them. And that's what I try to think about, like outside of me. And if I keep myself in my head for too long, um, it's hard. <laughs> I have a five minutes left, okay. Oh, okay, cool. How did we adapt to the corporate context and can we be ourselves? Well, when working in a corporate, you know, when a cor in the corporate world, you do have to understand, you know, there are things you say you cannot do um, because, again, it's a professional environment. However, thankfully, in my case, I have found that, you know, my user research team pretty much lets me be who I want to be. Um, I don't feel like I've had to, you know, qu for lack of a better term, nerf myself in terms of my personality and who I am. Um, so... Yeah, you know, I, I have a very supportive team. You know, I feel like I can be myself around them, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, but again, of course, there are limitations to what you should and should not do in this sort of world. Um, anybody else? I think it just helps to have like a general understanding of like respecting others and not overstepping. Um, but other than that, like, I feel like as long as you have that, you should be fine. 
I was thinking about something, and then I lost it. <laughs> All right. Okay, the question is, um, in our first position, is there a question that has always stuck with us in our heads? For example, I have a lot of questions just in my mind through the whole process. But one thing is like, am I doing the right thing? Just every detail, because not only being a URA for the first time, but also I'm a Asian, like I moved to America only like five years ago. So it's kind of tough to know everything, like in terms, even like very basic behavior. Um, I and uh, I feel lucky when I talk to other people, so even though are like Native American, um, they also have the same concern. Like they also concern of their behavior, th their, what they are talking about. So I think um, what helps me is to communicate with senior, just to voice out like, I don't know what to do at this moment. Um, do you have any answer for me? Um, another thing is writing journal. <laughs> I really like writing journal, I feel like. Um, it helps me a lot. So thank you everyone for um, sharing your time and your experience. We're very honored and thank you everyone for supporting us. Um, that is the rest of our presentation, our panel. So thank you so much for coming by and listening to our stories. Uh, yeah. <laughs>